Welcome to On the Middle East, the podcast of the award-winning media service El Monitor, where each week we talk with the decision makers and thought leaders who are making the news and shaping the trends in the Middle East. I'm Andrew Persoliti, president of El Monitor, and this week we'll be focusing on the consequences of Prime Minister Netanyahu's annexation plan, his intent to extend Israeli sovereignty over Jewish settlements in the West Bank. Now today, June 30th, uh, Netanyahu hinted that annexation may not proceed on July 1st, as originally anticipated. He said, quote, this is a complicated process with lots of diplomatic and security considerations that I can't get into. We said that annexation would be after July 1, unquote. To understand the politics behind annexation, what form it may eventually take, and its regional consequences. We'll be talking with Israel's ambassador and permanent representative to the United Nations, Danny Dannon, and then Riyad Bansour, ambassador and permanent observer of Palestine to the United Nations. These conversations and more are coming up after this short break. We are committed for negotiations. When I spoke in the Security Council, I approached directly Minister Malaki from the PA, and I told him, why you always come to speak in the Security Council and you are not willing to meet with me? You are not willing to have a meeting between President Abbas and Prime Minister Netanyahu. We are willing to come to Ramallah, to host you in Jerusalem. So yes, we are open for negotiations. Uh, We will not accept uh, the outcome of the negotiations in advance, but like we did with Egypt and with Jordan, We are willing to enter the room. Prime Minister Netanyahu said it clearly that he is willing to discuss all issues. uh, And we are waiting for the day that we will see a Palestinian leader like uh, Anwar Sadat, who who came and spoke directly to the Israeli people and told them, let's speak about peace, enough with the wars, enough with the bloodshed. Uh, I hope this day will come soon. Our president and the Security Council in more than one occasion announced that we want a collective process uh, uh, ushered by the Security Council or the Quartet, Quartet Plus, so that we can make sure that there are uh, several parties that can be trusted to be neutral and uh, honest uh, broker between us and the Israelis to ensure a successful political engagement that will lead to an agreement on all final status issues that will uh, succeed in ending the occupation and actualizing the two-state solution on the ground. For all these reasons, uh, we do not believe that, you know, that the plan of the United States is, uh, is, is a good basis for the discussion. Welcome back to On the Middle East. That was Ambassador Danny Dannon and Ambassador Riyad Mansour, the Israeli and Palestinian representatives to the United Nations. And we're going to be hearing from both of them today on the prospects for and potential consequences of Israel's annexation of Jewish settlements in the West Bank. First, let's run down where we are as of today, uh, June 30th. We mentioned earlier Prime Minister Netanyahu's statement that he may not proceed with annexation on July 1st, as had been originally expected. As we go to press, it is not necessarily going to be day one of the annexation process, but he might do something symbolic nonetheless. Netanyahu has faced internal and external pressure to pause on his annexation plans, and some of that pressure has seemed to have had an effect. Now, the agreement he made with Benny Gantz, head of the opposition Blue and White Party and Knesset Speaker, to form an emergency coalition government included a provision that the Knesset could introduce legislation to annexed or, or extend Israeli sovereignty over Jewish settlements in the West Bank beginning on July 1. And the Blue and White Party, or anyone else, couldn't do anything to stop it. Now, annexation is a legacy issue. Uh, for Netanyahu and his followers in Likud, and it's backed by many other Israelis, including uh, right-wing parties such as Yamina. And if you want that perspective, I urge you to listen to the podcast of Ben Kaspet on Israel this week, where he speaks with former Defense Minister Naftali Bennett about annexation. 
Now, getting back to Gantz, he never liked annexation, thought the timing was all wrong, but that was part of his deal with Netanyahu. So it was all up to Bibi whether he went ahead, when he went ahead, and what would be the nature of his annexation plans. And in that process, the prime minister had to weigh his ties with President Trump, who he felt would be inclined to support his effort, as well as the cost and benefits of annexation for Israel's regional policies and relations with Arab countries, especially Jordan and Egypt. Now, in recent days, Gantz has sought to be the pebble in the shoe of Netanyahu's annexation plan, saying the date is not set in stone, that Israel has other priorities like COVID-19, which is spiking in Israel, despite earlier successes in containing the virus. Gantz has been backed by former security officials and the international community who have rallied in opposition to annexation. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres weighed in last week, calling on Israel to step back from its plans. The EU has expressed its concerns. The Arab League has rallied behind the Palestinians who have severed ties and agreements with Israel and the U.S. And in a groundbreaking op-ed in an Israeli publication, UAE minister and ambassador to the U.S., Yusuf el a guest on this podcast a few weeks ago, warned that Israel's going ahead with annexation would set back normalization with Arab countries in addition, and especially to Israel's ties with Egypt and Jordan. More than anything else, and there are many variables we're talking about here, the pause in annexation is likely pivoting mostly on the position of King Abdullah of Jordan, who had warned of massive conflict if Israel proceeds with its annexation plans. Mossad chief Yossi Cohen visited King Abdullah last week, in recent days, I should say, to discuss Israel's plans. Now, to help us understand what to expect regarding annexation, we have the UN representatives for both the Israeli and Palestinian governments, Danny Dannon and Riyad Mansour. First up is Ambassador Danny Dannon. He's Israel's permanent representative to the United Nations. Ambassador Dannon previously served his country as a member of the Knesset from the Likud Party, as Minister of Science, Technology, and Space, and as Deputy Minister of Defense. Ambassador, welcome to On the Middle East. Thank you very much, Andrew. It is my pleasure being with you today. Let's get right into it. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu appears committed to going ahead with annexation of Jewish settlements in the West Bank. He believes this is a legacy issue. This was part of the deal with Benny Kantz on the coalition government, but it appears that the prime minister is getting some resistance to this initiative in Israel and outside Israel. Let's start within Israel. Defense Minister and co-PM Gantz, who has had some reservations about annexation despite the deal with Netanyahu, said that July 1 is not a sacred date, it's not etched in stone, and dealing with COVID-19, for example, is a higher priority for Israel. The prime minister says he's committed to the date. Ambassador, so what happens? So, Andrew, before we speak about uh, the political aspects, uh, allow me to speak about the term. I don't accept the term annexation. Uh, I call it applying sovereignty. And I want to go back to 1981, when Prime Minister Menachem Begin uh, pushed uh, legislation in the Knesset regarding uh, applying Israeli law on the Golan Heights that was also liberated in 1967. And he insisted in his speech in the Knesset that nobody should call it annexation, rather applying sovereignty, because you cannot annex something that belongs to you and you are not taking it from anyone else. It's not, there is no state in the world that claims that uh, Judea and Samaria belongs uh, uh, to this country. So regarding the sovereignty, uh, yes, it's coming up uh, in a few days. And according to the agreement between uh, uh, Minister Gantz and Prime Minister Netanyahu, it will be discussed only uh, beginning of July. And uh, also in the agreement, uh, blue and white, they do not have the veto power on this resolution, unlike any other resolution of the government. So basically, in in this unity government, Blue and White received the power to veto any decision of the government except of the issue of applying sovereignty. 
So I think they will start the discussions. And what I told my colleagues in the Security Council a few days ago, maybe you should wait. Wait a few days, wait a few weeks. Let's see what the government of Israel will decide. And then we can debate it. We can argue about it, whether it's good for peace, bad for peace, good for negotiations. I asked them, I don't see any negotiations in the last few years that I'm here at the UN. So maybe it will be a good way to, to ignite the process. But I think first we have to wait for the Israeli government to discuss this issue and, and to decide whether uh, they want to do it and uh, to what extent. Ambassador, you and I have talked in the past about your own diplomacy and relationships at the United Nations with Arab countries. Are you concerned about the reactions so far from the Arab League, uh, including and especially Jordan and Egypt, about proceeding at this time? So we, we respect uh, our neighbors. Uh, you know, we discuss with them all, all issues. We also discuss those issues with countries that do not have uh, official uh, peace treaty with Israel, but we collaborate on, on many other issues. So we do have that uh, discussion. We hear them. Uh, and uh, like we speak with the uh, other countries in the world. But at the end of the day, the decision about that will be taken by the Israeli government, period. It will not be taken in Washington, not in the Security Council, not even in the General Assembly, only by the government of Israel. And I want to remind the, the audience that we, we had similar situations. In 1948, David Ben-Gurion took the decision to, to declare a state and many countries threatened him. In 1967, Prime Minister Eshkol decided to apply sovereignty uh, over the United Jerusalem, and he was criticized for that. And like I mentioned earlier, Menachem Begin applied sovereignty on the Golan Heights, despite strong opposition coming from the US. And two years ago, uh, when President Trump decided to move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, we also heard a lot of threats a lot, a lot of uh, voices coming from different directions, uh, and we saw that the outcome uh, was an uh, uh, important one for Israel and for the U.S. Let me just ask specifically about Jordan. Do you think that Jordan's concerns expressed by the king, that this could indeed jeopardize the Israeli-Jordan peace agreement? Uh, how seriously do you weigh those statements by the Kingdom of Jordan. And I noticed that the uh, head of, of Mossad, your national intelligence agency, was, was recently meeting uh, in Jordan. Uh, tell us how you see that relationship around this issue. We, we respect uh, the Kingdom of Jordan. We, we have a, a dialogue with the king and uh, with other colleagues in Amman. We will continue to do so. Uh, and then we have an important peace treaty. And also we value their involvement on issues like the Temple Mount and stability in the region. So yes, we do speak with them, we hear them. And I think when the government will have to decide about this issue, they will take it into consideration. The same way we do with our colleagues in Washington. So I think the government, when they will have to reach a decision, they, they will look at this, all of those issues, in the position of the US, the EU, Jordan, Egypt, other important allies, and at the end of the day, the government will have to reach a decision about it. You maintain close relationships with supporters of Israel in different communities across the United States, not just in Washington. What are you hearing from them about Israel's decision and the prospects for Prime Minister Netanyahu proceeding with sovereignty over settlements in the West Bank? Uh, what's what's different, if anything's different, about attitudes towards U.S.-Israel relations around this matter? So it depends with whom you speak. You know, you know. In one hand, you have the evangelicals who are strong supporters of the state of Israel, and I'm sure they will, they will be excited of the idea of applying sovereignty on the part of Judea and Samaria. You have others who are, who are more skeptical about it. But I think the majority of the Jewish community in the U.S. will support any decision of the Israeli government. And I think that is the approach that they should adapt. Yes, you can speak about it, you can criticize our government, but once there is a decision of an elected government, you have to stand behind it. And I want to bring you back exactly 15 years ago, 
where the Israeli government decided unilaterally to withdraw from Gaza. That was a hard moment for us here in Israel. I was against it, but the Knesset voted on this resolution and everybody had to implement the resolution. This is the strength of our democracy, and I think we will see the same amount of support after any decision of this current government. Ambassador, how is Israel viewing the U.S. presidential election, and does that factor into your government's decision-making whether Donald Trump gets another four years or is replaced by Joe Biden, who has also been a longtime friend of Israel and the prime minister? So, Andrew, whenever I ask about U.S. politics, I say we have so much politics in Jerusalem, we don't need to interfere in the politics in the U.S. Nice. But uh, I, I, I think that uh, we have to take into consideration that, uh, that there will be elections this coming November, and I think that the decision should be taken in the next few weeks, because uh, to take a, a decision like that a few weeks before the elections I don't think it will be wise. So I, I think if a decision will be taken, it will happen in the next uh, two months, uh, and it will not be too close to the election, so nobody can actually uh, connect it or, or blame us that we are doing it because of that. Ambassador, is the government of Israel still committed to direct talks with the Palestinians on a two-state solution? We are committed for negotiations. Uh, when I spoke in the Security Council, I approached directly uh, Minister El Malaki from the PA, and I told him, why you always come to speak in the Security Council and you are not willing to meet with me? You are not willing to have a meeting between President Abbas and Prime Minister Netanyahu. We are willing to come to Ramallah, to host you in Jerusalem. Uh, so yes, we are open for negotiations. Uh, we will not accept uh, the outcome of the negotiations in advance, but like we did with Egypt and with Jordan, we are willing to enter the room. We are, Prime Minister Netanyahu said it clearly that he is willing to discuss all issues uh, and we are waiting for the day that we will see a Palestinian leader like uh, Anwar Sadat who, who came and spoke directly to the Israeli people and told them, let's speak about peace, enough with the wars, enough with the bloodshed. Uh, I hope this day will come soon. Ambassador, I appreciate your taking time today. It was a pleasure to have you with us on, on the Middle East. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Thank you. I'm now pleased to welcome Ambassador Riyad Mansour, Permanent Observer of Palestine to the United Nations. Mr. Ambassador, welcome to On the Middle East. Thank you. Let's get started. Prime Minister Netanyahu signaled today that there might be a pause in his annexation plans, or that we might not expect the process to begin July 1st, as we all originally anticipated. Do you consider his statement today an encouraging sign, and does it signal an opening for resuming direct Israeli-Palestinian talks? Well, uh, we have been uh, working uh, for the last uh, Few months along with the uh, entire international community to bring sufficient political pressure on the government uh, of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu not uh, to take this unilateral legal uh, uh, step and uh, to cancel it uh, altogether because, uh, as has been characterized, by all those who spoke uh, in the Security Council last meeting on the 24th as being reached to international law and Security Council resolutions, and everyone, including the Secretary General of the United Nations, appealed to the government of Israel to cancel such plans. So we hope that the Israeli government will not take this uh, unilateral uh, step and cancel altogether the uh, annexation plans. Ambassador, do you uh, believe that there is an opportunity for Israeli-Palestinian talks? And if there is indeed a pause, uh, again, that will be uh, seen uh, whether there is or not, but if there is indeed a pause, do you, do you think this is a diplomatic opening uh, that would allow direct talks with Israel 
Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu also said yesterday that he is he's open to talks with the Palestinian leadership. Uh, the issue I don't believe is the talks, is uh, the basis of uh, talk. Uh, there is a global consensus on the two-state solution uh, on the borders of uh, the 4th of June 1967 and the terms of reference of the parameters which uh, they are rooted in international law and UN resolutions. Now, uh, on such basis, the Palestinian leadership declared more than one occasion willingness and readiness to engage in a political process that would lead to the objective of ending the occupation and independence of the state of Palestine uh, with East Jerusalem as its capital, living in peace and harmony with all of its neighbors, including Israel. President Abbas reiterated the same idea when he came and spoke before the Security Council. And in fact, he said his readiness to engage in the political uh, uh, process, uh, even if the Security Council or the Quartet could call for it. When he was in New York, he expressed from the Chamber of the Security Council readiness and willingness uh, to do so. So that that is our position in the record is not that the gimmick of negotiating for the sake of negotiations and creating illegal facts such as settlements and land grab as the Israeli government is doing and yet pretending that they are interested in talks and peace while in reality they are creating facts on the ground that are completely the opposite direction of this. Ambassador, you have already uh, announced stepping back from previous commitments and agreements with the U.S. and Israel in response to Netanyahu's announcement about annexation. What does this actually mean, and how does severing this cooperation serve Palestinian interests? Well, uh, I, I, I take it that you are alluding to the decision of the Palestinian leadership uh, in, in anticipation of possibility of annexation, which uh, from uh, the view of the Palestinian leadership, that it means that Israel is violating the essence of these uh, agreements and understandings between the Palestinian side and the Israeli side, and also the United States. So if, if the Israeli side and the U.S. through the uh, Trump uh, plan uh, are violating all these agreements, then the Palestinian leadership is saying, why should we uh, be uh, uh, continue uh, to be uh, committed to these agreements that are being violated? by the other side. So that's why the president announced that, uh, uh, you know, that we are not uh, uh, honoring and respecting these agreements because the other side is walking away from them. Now, how does this, you know, uh, help the Palestinian people? Of course, anything that uh, is honoring and upholding international law uh, and uh, will of the international community reflected in uh, these resolutions at the United Nations is in line with the interest of the Palestinians. But if the other side is not honoring them and violating them, then it would not be in the interest of the Palestinian people. And uh, we cannot continue uh, to pretend that the other side is honoring these agreements, while in essence it's not. The Palestinian position on, on the Trump peace plan, its opposition to the Trump peace plan is, is well known. Can you envision dealing with Israel and the United States on the basis of the Trump peace plan, at least as a means or an opportunity to begin a conversation? Uh, on the basis of the Trump peace plan, no. And I'll explain that to you. The, the U.S. administration 
tried for uh, almost two and a half years since their decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of uh, the state of Israel and move the embassy there, uh, in which it is a violation of uh, international law and the Security Council resolutions. From that moment on, uh, the different U.S. representatives came often to the Security Council and tried to convince the international community that a global consensus on the two-state solution, on the parameters and on the basis that we all know international law and relevant view and resolution. They tried to convince everyone that these uh, positions are uh, not useful and did not resolve uh, the conflict. And they said that their ideas, which they did not share with anyone until the 28th of uh, January 2020, uh, they tried to convince all of us that what would work is their ideas and to uh, negotiate or to engage on the basis of these ideas. Nobody accepted that uh, assertion, uh, with the exception of Israel, although even Israel, Israeli acceptance is, uh, we don't know exactly what it means because we follow uh, debate, the Israeli side, those who support some elements of the Trump uh, plan and others who oppose other elements. Be that as it may, since the global consensus is not accepted, the Trump plan to replace what we have collectively worked for for almost 30 years since the Madrid uh, conference, uh, then uh, the, the, the party that is uh, seeking uh, negation of what our collective position in the international community uh, should review its position and should come back to the global consensus. Because the global consensus was constructed among the efforts of all of us, including the uh, administration of President Bush, the father, playing a very important role in the convening of the Madrid conference, then the administration of President Clinton, then the administration of President George W., and then the administration of President Barack Obama. They contributed to the collective consensus. And then this administration is trying to throw this collective effort by the West side and to replace it by these ideas that are violating international law left and right. So from our perspective, we do not accept uh, these ideas as the basis of discussions. Besides that for a while, the US administration was the only shepherd of uh, uh, negotiation between the Palestinian side and the Israeli side. And instead of being uh, uh, honest broker or neutral between the two sides, with the release of uh, the Trump plan, uh, they showed that they are almost identical to the position of the Israeli government, and then therefore they uh, lost their uh, uh, capability of being the only broker to usher this process. And uh, our president in the Security Council, in more than one occasion, announced that we want a collective process uh, uh, ushered by the Security Council or the Quartet, Quartet Plus, so that we can make sure that there are uh, several parties that can be trusted to be neutral and uh, honest uh, broker between us and the Israelis to ensure a successful political engagement that would lead to an agreement on all final status issues that will uh, succeed in ending the occupation and actualizing the two-state uh, solution on the ground. For all these reasons, uh, we do not believe that, you know, that the plan of the United States is, uh, is, is a good basis for the discussion. Of course, these are their views. 
uh, anyone can bring whatever view they have, but they cannot box us to uh, exclusively restrict ourselves to reacting to their plan. Uh, our plan is the global consensus. Our plan is the plan of everyone. Our plan is the plan of, uh, of uh, the Quartet and the Security Council and the UN. And the details uh, there is rooted in international law and UN uh, resolutions and the Arab Peace Initiative just only to mention some of these bases of, uh, of what uh, could accomplish uh, peace based on justice between us and the Israelis. We are committed to that. That is our plan. It is the plan of the entire international community. And the party that deviated from that plan is the Trump administration, and they cannot impose their will on us and on the international community and to impose a solution that will not be uh, based on justice and fairness, and it will violate uh, international law and so many resolutions. Of that. Ambassador, the Arab League has strongly backed the Palestinian position. Are you pleased with the support you're receiving from the leading Arab states, including Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE, as you, you deal with this issue of uh, annexation? Uh, we are, uh, you know, satisfied with the position of uh, the Arab League. One can perhaps ask, you know, uh, uh, that more could be done. Of course, there's uh, every situation, there will be always more things that uh, can be done. But we are uh, uh, so, uh, satisfied with the position of uh, the League of Arab States, whether it is at the level of the summit, in Saudi Arabia or in Tunisia or at the level of the Ministerial uh, uh, Council or at the level of the Council of Arab Ambassadors at the United Nations. I am uh, very uh, thankful for the effort of my colleagues, uh, the ambassadors of uh, different Arab countries at the United Nations, in which we collectively have been very active for the last few months in building a very powerful international front, a principal front that is opposing annexation. And all these efforts were culminated in having a Security Council meeting on the 24th of this month at a ministerial level in which the position of everyone except one member in the Security Council that was loud and clear, very principled, along with the Secretary General of the United Nations. And uh, those uh, who spoke uh, in that direction sent a very powerful message to Israel uh, to abandon the annexation plans, not to implement them, and uh, to abide by the global consensus rooted in international law so that we can keep the hope alive and keep the possibility of peace between uh, Israel and the state of Palestine uh, still on the table so that we can succeed in, an agree in reaching an agreement that would lead to the end of occupation and the independence of the state of Palestine and therefore having a two-state solution. Vastor, final question. Could you clarify for us uh, what happened with the shipment of medical supplies from the United Arab Emirates, which was intended for the Palestinian people. Have those supplies been received? And how do you characterize this misunderstanding? At least that's how it's been conveyed in the press. Uh, I am not uh, uh, aware of all of the details of, uh, of this issue, because as you know, uh, it is related to the arrival of planes from United Arab Emirates to uh, Tel, Aviv, Tel Aviv Airport. Uh, but uh, my understanding that through appropriate uh, channels of the United Nations, uh, these shipments eventually uh, were uh, given to different UN agencies that are working on the ground helping Palestinians. Ambassador Mansour, thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us today on On the Middle East. 
Thank you very much for having me. And we will be back after this short break. If you're listening to this podcast, you obviously care about the Middle East. And if you do, you should probably be reading El Monitor. El Monitor is a global newsroom headquartered in Washington, D.C., with a network of over 160 contributors around the world. El Monitor offers first class reporting and analysis from a range of perspectives and an approach that represents the highest journalistic standards, as well as an award winning commitment to press freedom and independence. If you haven't done so already, visit us at elmonitor.com, check out our articles, and sign up for our free newsletters. There's a lot to choose from, including the Week in Review, an essay that offers unusual insights and forecasts into the region based upon El Monitor's outstanding reporting. And if you haven't done so, please subscribe to our El Monitor podcast on your favorite podcast platform. On Israel with Ben Caspit, and on the Middle East with me, Andrew Parasoliti. Welcome back to On the Middle East. It looks like Prime Minister Netanyahu has heard those concerned about annexation, and his government may be in the process of a reset. If and when he goes ahead, the scope of annexation may be less than originally envisioned, perhaps just a few settlements. If so, and there is a pause or reset, my guess is that King Abdullah's appeals may have tipped the scales. If we are now in the realm of symbolic or half steps in the short term, the prime minister's approach may allow him to claim he is going ahead, as he promised, and meanwhile, allow everyone else to pause just enough to avoid the massive conflict that King Abdullah had warned about and spark another round of diplomacy. That said, the July 1 date may slip, but annexation in some form may still be in the cards in the coming weeks and months, as Ambassador Dannon said, as Netanyahu keeps an eye as well on the U.S. presidential election in November. The question remains whether this whole affair will lead to renewed dialogue between Israel and the Palestinians under the Trump plan. And based on Ambassador Mansour's remarks, at least today, that seems doubtful. Thank you all for listening to On the Middle East. I'm Andrew Parasoliti. I will be back next week. And in the meantime, please sign up for this and our other El Monitor podcast on Israel with Ben Caspit at your favorite podcast platform.